Hello, everyone, and welcome to another exciting episode of Common Sense with Dr. Ben Carson. I'm your host, Ben Carson, and we have a fascinating program for you today. Who is David Grush? Perhaps you've heard that name recently. You've seen him on television. He's a retired Air Force officer, former intelligence official, who's made some fascinating claims about the U.S. government's secret UFO recovery program. He recently testified that the United States is in possession of non-human spacecraft and remains of pilots. What should we make of these claims? Are they believable? Are there aliens among us? And uh, to help sort all that out today, we have an expert in the, in the field, uh, Jimmy Aiken. Welcome, Jimmy, and thank you so much for being with us on this podcast. So much. It's my pleasure. Glad to be here. Unidentified flying objects, UFOs, now referred to as unidentified aerial phenomena, UAPs. Uh, you're much more the expert in just the UFOs. You take lots of different topics and with great rigor. Uh, investigate them, uh, helping us to understand different phenomena. UFO is just one of them. But uh, how did you get involved in sort of searching out strange things like UFOs? Well, I grew up in the 1970s, and at the time, there were a lot of documentaries on TV about mysterious topics, you know, UFOs, Bigfoot, Loch Ness Monster, all that kind of stuff. And as a kid, I found it interesting. And then in the 80s and 90s, we got the Unsolved Mystery Show. Leonard Nimoy, Mr. Spock himself, even had a show for a while called In Search Of that looked at mysterious right. phenomena. And a few years ago, I work with a Christian podcasting network called StarQuest. And a few years ago, we were brainstorming potential ideas for future podcasts. And I said, well, I've got this interest in mysteries. We could do a mystery-oriented show. And we ended up coming up with a podcast called Jimmy Akin's Mysterious World, which is, you know, it's on all the podcast channels and stuff, Apple and Spotify and things. Um, but uh, basically, we I started researching mysterious topics in depth, and that included UFOs. And we've done a bunch of UFO-related episodes. Well... Uh, you know, you're an author and a speaker, but uh, also senior apologist for Catholic Answers with over 25 years of experience. Yeah, over 30 now. 30. <laughs> <laughs> Explaining faith, excessive background in Bible, theology, church fathers, philosophy, canon law, and liturgy. And uh, you mentioned uh, your podcast. You're also... Uh, co-host with Dom Bettinelli, uh, looking at anything from ancient mysteries uh, to folk tales to crimes to conspiracies, and even supernatural and paranormal uh, phenomena. So we want to hear a little bit more about that. But, you know, a few years ago, Congress was once again faced with all these UAPs. And, you know, there's a lot of stories on television about it. Military personnel were experiencing unexplained phenomena. Can you describe some of those things that they were just that they were telling Congress about? Yeah. So um, the the modern UFO craze uh, really began in 1947. There was a businessman named Kenneth Arnold up in the Pacific Northwest who was an aviator. And he was flying his plane. And while he was flying it, he saw a series of a kind of a convoy or what appeared to him to be a sort of convoy of unusual aerial craft that were bobbing up and down as they went along in the sky. He compared the way they were moving to uh, skipping a flying saucer, uh, skipping a saucer across water, the way they were bobbing up and down. And the press latched onto that phrase and called them flying saucers. They fairly quickly were relabeled as unidentified flying objects because nobody knew what they were, and the military said, they're not ours, this isn't one of our projects. And that launched a, a big wave of public interest 
in UFOs. People suspected they might be coming from another planet, either in our solar system or elsewhere in the universe. And because they were in our airspace, the government decided to have the military, and specifically the Air Force, which was originally part of the Army but then split off, uh, look, to look at this. And they started a number of projects that went through different names like Project Grudge, Project Sign. Eventually it became known as Project Blue Book. And they would look at reports that people were sending in of sighting UFOs and sometimes sighting their occupants. And initially, they took a kind of dim, well, after a certain point, they took a kind of dim view of these. And they hired uh, individuals such as uh, an astronomer named J. Allen Hynek to more or less debunk them and say, these, these aren't anything alien. We don't know what some of them are, but we don't think they're alien. Eventually, though, Hynek kind of came around and became, said there's more here than what Project Blue Book is indicating, and he actually became a UFO supporter. Now, the government ended Project Blue Book at the end of 1969, and the way they did that was they hired a panel to review at least some of the work that Blue Book had done and not try to answer the question, are these really alien, but instead answer the question, are they a threat to U.S. national security that would warrant us in continuing to study them? And the panel came back and said, there's no evidence that they're a threat. Well, people could debate that because there are reports of UFOs taking an interest, for example, in American nuclear facilities and even doing some strange things to American and Soviet nuclear facilities. But what the panel came back with was saying they're not really a threat, and that justified the Air Force in closing down Project Blue Book. But still, these reports kept coming in. And even though they didn't want to talk about it in public, the uh, Congress, and particularly Senator Harry Reid of Nevada, took an interest in this, and they authorized a covert program to study them within the Defense Department. And this program um, goes by different acronyms. It's sometimes called OSAP. Um, it's also called ATIP in some press reports. But basically, it was operating in the background on kind of a shoestring budget in the 2010s. And then in 2017, uh, one of the individuals who was one of the leaders of the, of, of the ATIP program, a gentleman named Luis Elizondo, or Lou Elizondo, uh, retired from the program and decided that he wanted to go public in order to create public discussion of this program, which he couldn't really do as long as he was a member of it. And he was able to get three videos of UFOs, or now UAPs as they were being called, uh, declassified. And in the year 2017, the New York Times uh, published an article, which was the first of a series of articles, about ATIP and Lou Elizondo and these videos, and the videos showed up online. They were taken in different locations. Um, for example, one of them was known as the Tic Tac video, was taken off the coast of San Diego, where we had um, some naval maneuvers happening. And they were, among other things, testing out a new naval sensing system, you know, because we, we want our, our carrier groups to have very accurate sensors. And some fighter pilots encountered an object that looks kind of like a Tic Tac, only bigger. Yeah. And so this, now what year was this? this was in 2004. Okay. And the lead pilot in that case was a gentleman named David Fravor, who's since gone public with, with his account of things. Other pilots have also commented on it who were involved. And so um, the Tic Tac incident on the West Coast, there were also a couple of other videos, the Gimbal video, the Go Fast video, uh, which were taken elsewhere, including on the East Coast. And, you know, these started a big public discussion. And in the last five, six years, um, it has continued. And Congress got involved, and they mandated that the Defense Department 
reignite this program. ATIP had, had kind of faded. It wasn't being given funding, and they were operating it on kind of a shoestring budget in spare time. But Congress then mandated that they create a specific program to look into what our military pilots and others are encountering that they don't understand and report back to Congress and the American public on their findings. And so that's kind of set the stage for where we're at now. Interesting. Now, you know, there's been a lot of people, obviously, who had things to say about this. Um, But recently, uh, David Gresh, I think that's how you pronounce his name. Yeah. Um, Who exactly is he? I mean, why... Why is he sort of risen so fast? Is he credible? Well, he's he's. it depends on what you mean by credible. So David Grush is a former military officer who was, after he left the military, he was hired into this program. And he was he had a top secret clearance, so he was read on to various classified programs. And part of his mandate was to survey government activity related to UFOs or UAPs and coordinate that information with the newly mandated program to study them. Because, you know, the government is a sprawling bureaucracy and the military is a sprawling bureaucracy and it's got lots of little compartmentalized siloed pigeonholes where stuff's going on. And so one uh, one of David Grush's assignments was to contact other government and defense department agencies and say, what do you got that deals with UFOs? Because we need to know about it. Uh, Our program has been tasked with overseeing this area. And what he encountered were some people, he, he says, who told him that we had a crash retrieval program where UFOs that had either crashed or were found abandoned had been taken into U.S. custody, and in some cases it even included biological material, the, presumably the bodies of non-human pilots. And they told him that we have these programs, but then they wouldn't share the information with the um, with the department that's supposed to oversee all this. Instead, according to him, they were evading the congressional mandate to report this information. And so he filed a complaint um, with the Office of the Inspector General, and then he suffered reprisals for having made this complaint. And not everything is clear about exactly what form the reprisals took, but the U.S. has whistleblower protection laws, and he claimed they were in defiance of those laws, that he was being punished as a whistleblower illegally. And he ended up retiring from the government program so that he also could go public, just like Lou Elizondo had previously, and talk about these things, not disclosing classified information, but talking about the general situation. And so that's what happened uh, recently, was he went public and said, here's what I've been told, and there are programs that are evading congressional oversight. And that led Congress to then have uh, David Grush and also David Fravor, the pilot from the Tic Tac incident, and one other gentleman come in and testify to them about what they knew. Interesting. Do you do you believe it? Well, I believe that I believe that David Fravor is probably telling the truth about what he was told. Um, he he seems to he doesn't seem to be lying at least from what I can tell. So I think he probably was told these things. He was told that we have alien craft and even alien bodies. Whether that is accurate or not is a separate question, and and it's a question that needs to be taken seriously because we have previous incidents where such claims at least were exaggerated and may well be false. Um, In the 1980s and 1990s, there were a set of documents, which are now known as the Majestic 12 documents, that started to emerge in the ufological community, the community that studies UFOs. And these documents were supposedly from the government, they were and the military, they dealt with a body 
a group of 12 men known as Majestic 12, that was its code name, or MJ-12, that had been created by President Truman in 1947 to deal with the UFO issue. And it looks like, now these documents were coming out in the late 80s and early 90s, and that was a particularly sensitive time in the Cold War. You know, we're having this conflict with Russia, they're very unstable at this point, and eventually the Soviet Union ended up falling. But during the 1980s, we almost went to nuclear war more than once, such as after the 1983 Able Archer incident, where some uh, war games we were doing almost accidentally caused a nuclear war. So we're dealing with the Russians. They're very unstable at this point in their history. We're trying to avoid a nuclear war. And all of a sudden, these UFO documents start emerging that say things like, oh, America has reverse engineered UFO tech, and we've got a secret treaty with the aliens. And and it looks like these documents were fake because they Excellent. can... On purpose. Yeah. yeah. They contain anachronisms, you know, like things that they wouldn't have said it this way on this date if this is a real historical document, things like that. And so it looks like this was a, that the MJ-12 documents were a military mind game, that it was an attempt to fake out through the UFO community to fake out the Soviets in just thinking, oh, you know, um, maybe we don't want to go to war with the Americans right now if they've got alien tech and alien allies. So um, now we have the situation in, in Russia where they're fighting Ukraine, and Vladimir Putin has been nuclear saber-rattling, and all of a sudden we have resurgent claims about we've got alien tech and alien bodies and stuff like that, maybe an alien treaty, and it's a little coincidental to have this emerging. I mean, you're a biblical scholar, scholar of the canon. You, you know all of this stuff. Um, how does that jive with UFOs? Well, um, there are people who claim that UFOs are found in the Bible. For example, a lot of people in the UFO community will claim that Ezekiel had a vision of a UFO, or he actually saw a UFO. He saw the wheel way up in the middle of the air. <laughs> yeah, and it's often described as a wheel within a wheel. The thing is, though, we know what this was. This is this is not a UFO. Instead, what um, what... Ezekiel is describing is God's uh, Merkava, his throne, his chariot. Um, and we know what these objects look like because we see them in archaeology. Uh, we have, you know, carvings, for example, on, on walls of here's a god or a king sitting on his wheeled chariot throne. And so he, Ezekiel was not seeing a flying saucer. He was seeing a wheel that was part of a wheeled throne or chariot throne. And these are well known in archaeology, but unfortunately a lot of people in the UFO community don't know so much about archaeology. And so they're misreading this text. If you ask my opinion, you know, and I've read the entire Bible, uh, you know, I study it regularly, I don't think it says anything about UFOs or aliens one way or another. This is not a concept that was on the mental map of the biblical right. authors. And so I don't think the Christian faith says anything about the existence or non-existence of extraterrestrial life. I think this is a question for science to settle. It's not something that you can settle um, theologically. The most we could say theologically is, well, we know that God created mankind, and we know that he created other intelligent creatures, too, because that's what the angels are. They're non-biological intelligences. Humans are biological intelligences. We got a big, God made a big universe. If he chose, he could create biological intelligences elsewhere in it, in which case they would just be other children of God. But They're smart. They won't come here. <laughs> there certainly are some drawbacks to visiting planet Earth. Yeah. That's pretty funny. Now, uh, what what does the DOD say about about these claims, and, and what does Gresh's colleagues, the 
Are any of them coming to his defense, or are they all kind of saying he's a little nutty? No, there are other people. And like I said, I think Grush is telling the truth about what he was told. My question is, was he being lied to? Um, and that's something that we need to penetrate these programs in order to find out. But other people have said, you know, he's a credible guy. And other people have said, I've been told the same things. So these claims are being circulated. Now, the the head of the UAP study program and others have tried to downplay this. And they use fairly carefully phrased language because they don't want to set off a public panic. They don't want get people to get too hyped up about this. And so they'll say things like, we haven't found any credible evidence of alien intelligence. And what they mean by that is we haven't found anything that conclusively proves alien intelligence. But that doesn't mean they haven't found some evidence. And it doesn't mean they've been able to explain everything. In fact, they have not been able to explain things like the Tic Tac incident in a credible way. So clearly something was going on there. It could be a project that was even more deeply classified than ATIP knew, a, you know, a U.S. government project. It could be a project from one of our you know, nation-state competitors like Russia or China. But, um, but something's going on there that has yet to be explained. And even though that's not proof of extra, extraterrestrial intelligence, that's at least one possibility for hypothetically what it could be. Well, have, have you yourself visited Area 51? No, because I don't have a security clearance and they'll lock me up if I try to go there. I have I have visited Roswell, New Mexico, though. Okay, what what did you conclude uh, after your visit? And, and what do you think is the most credible example of a sighting? Well, so in terms of in terms of visiting Roswell, I concluded that that uh, alien related tourism, UFO related tourism, is very important to Roswell's economy. Um, because it there was cute alien stuff all over town. They'd even painted painted the street lights to have alien faces on them. Um, they also had a little sign on on the Better Business Bureau that they, they had taped on the door that had alleged alien writing in it. Although it was really just Greek letters put in random order, and I read Greek, so it's like, oh, that's just Greek, and it doesn't say anything. It's nonsense. Um, when it comes to credible sightings, there are some sightings that, I mean, I think the Tic Tac is a credible one. We, we have video footage of it. The footage that's been released is very fuzzy, um, but we undoubtedly have higher grade footage than that. They're just not releasing it because they don't want our competitors to know how good or how not good our top end sensing equipment is. Um, there have been other historical incidents that I think are genuine incidents. Uh, for example, I don't think they're all hoaxes and so forth. For example, in, um, in 1980, outside of Houston, Texas, there uh, was an incident known as the Cash Landrum UFO encounter. And basically these two women, um, Betty Cash and Vicki Landrum, were driving at night, this was around Christmas time, and they were driving at night along with uh, the grandson of one of the women, and they encountered a, a, a light in the sky over the road in front of them, and it descended, and they could see it was a kind of diamond-shaped craft. It had a ring of lights around it, and it was emitting flame of some kind to project itself. And when the flame would pulse, it would rise in the air. When the flame would get weaker, it would sink in the air. So it was using fl some kind of reaction mass, some kind of flame as propulsion. They got out of their car because it was blocking the road in front of them, and they didn't want to drive under it with the flame. So they, they got out of the car to look at it. Um, actually, the grandson, Colby, stayed in the car, but Vicky and Betty both got out, and Betty stayed out for about five minutes. Vicky stayed out for about three minutes just looking at this. Initially, now, these were, they were both Christian women, and they didn't really believe in aliens, so they interpreted this as possibly the end of the world, and that this may have been a sign of the second coming, and in fact... Um, uh, Vicky even told her grandson, Jesus is going to come out of that and, and he won't hurt us. 
But then they got out and they could feel the heat of this thing. And it was so hot that Vicky, when she touched the you know vinyl dash of the car, it left a handprint. And when Betty tried to get back in the car, she the she couldn't touch the door handle. It was so hot. She had to use the sleeve of her leather jacket to get it open. And then they go home, and oh, they I'm sorry, the uh, the craft then rises in the air, and all of a sudden, like a dozen helicopters show up and escort it away. And then Betty and Vicky and Colby go home. And within a few hours, they're all suffering from acute radiation syndrome. You know, they're, especially the two women who got out of the car, their hair is falling out, they're, they're, they're having sunburn, they're having nausea, they're having all the symptoms of radiation exposure. And there are medical records of that. There are also other witnesses who saw either the craft or the helicopters that escorted it. So I think this is a very credible sighting. I think this event really happened. The question is, what is it? And in my opinion, the most plausible explanation is this was a classified military program that they stumbled on. It was Christmas time. They were testing when not a lot of people would be around. This involved some kind of nuclear propulsion, which we know the government has researched. And that's why the helicopters were there to escort it when it had trouble. If it had been an alien UFO, you wouldn't expect U.S. helicopters to show up and escort it away. Um, but if it's a classified military program, you would expect them to have helicopters on standby in case of a problem, which then happened. So I think this was a genuine sighting. I think it was very credible, but I think it was almost certainly human rather than alien. You're a very logical and commonsensical person, so we really thank you for being here. Sometimes you get some pretty odd people talking about things, and they have no basis for what they're saying at all. But um, you know, I have to say again that uh, you are a UFOlogist. Is that what they call somebody who studies UFOlogist? Yeah, a UFOlogist or a ufologist. Um, I'm not professionally trained as one, but I do study the subject. What is your perspective on UFOs and God? Well, um, so God could create other biological intelligences in his creation if he chooses. I don't know whether he has or not. Um, based on the size of the universe and how much stuff is out there, you know, billions and trillions of stars, I would suspect that there's life elsewhere in the universe. Um, in fact, I actually agree with scientists who sp suspect there may be primitive life even elsewhere in our own solar system, um, you know, microbes and stuff like that. But um, I suspect... Or in the depths of the ocean. Oh, and certainly it's in the oceans here on Earth. One of the questions is, is it on the oceans also like of Saturn's moon Enceladus or Jupiter's moon Europa or under Martian soil? There's actually a quite a good case that we actually detected life on on Mars in the 1970s and they kind of didn't they kind of dismissed it but if you look at the actual test results they indicated life but um they changed the criteria after the fact to avoid that conclusion so i think there may be primitive life elsewhere in our own solar system i think given the size of the universe it's probable that god created other intelligences elsewhere i can't prove that but i think it's it would be my guess in terms of could they be visiting here and that's what's responsible for the ufo phenomena well i wouldn't say that i think it's probable but i think it's possible I can't rule out that they would get here uh, either faster than light or slower than light. Um, we know slower than light travel between star systems is possible. Um, and many physicists think faster than light travel actually may be possible as well. We have um, designs for the concept of how to make a warp drive work, just like on Star Trek. Um, and, and, there are still problems to be solved, but a lot of physicists think this is possible. So I can't rule out that some aliens might be visiting us. I also can't rule out other possibilities. Um, there are other proposals that would explain UFOs in non-conventional terms. You know, even if you say, okay, it's not all hoaxes, it's not all classified tech, there is something exotic going on here. 
that exotic thing doesn't have to be aliens. It could be time travelers, because under Einsteinian physics, time travel is possible. And um, it could be someone from another dimension, you know, because other dimensions are possible. A lot of Christians, not a majority, but some Christians suspect demons may be responsible. And I can't rule that out either. In some cases, I would want to see evidence in a particular case. So what evidence do you have that in this case it was a demon? I don't think demons are a good general explanation. We shouldn't, without any evidence, just say, oh, it must be demons. Well, it could be, but it also but it could be. It could also be brothers from another planet that God created there and are visiting here now. So we, without evidence, we can't say one way or another. So I think there are a number of possible explanations. You know, this is this is only one of the things that you've investigated. What are some of the other things that would uh, kind of blow people away? Well, on Mysterious World, I look at a lot of different things. Um, we look at both natural and uh, para paranormal and supernatural mysteries. So sometimes we do historical mysteries, like what happened in this historical incident. Sometimes we do a little bit of true crime. Sometimes we do scientific mysteries. Um, those are all natural ones we'd cover. We also look at paranormal ones. I've looked at Bigfoot. I've looked at the Loch Ness Monster. Um, I, I've looked at psychic powers. Um, and surprisingly, I was surprised. There's more evidence for psychic functioning than certainly I thought there was in the beginning. Um, because it is studied scientifically by parapsychologists, and they do really rigorous experiments on it. Do uh, you think that they're, they're probably... Uh, things that we could do that we just haven't gotten contact with, with just our mental capabilities. Yeah, or some people have. Um, and and this is actually not new. One of the things that uh, I was interested to discover is going back hundreds of years to Christian figures like St. Augustine and St. Thomas Aquinas, who were not only saints, they're also what are known as doctors of the church, which means they're like top-tier theologians, they believed in what we would today call psychic powers. Uh, both Augustine and Aquinas believed in what we would call precognition. Aquinas called it natural prophecy to distinguish it from the supernatural prophecy that God gives. Um, Aquinas also believed in a form of what's called telekinesis or psychokinesis. Um, so Christian thought has been open to God may have built these natural abilities into us. And some have even speculated that before the fall, we would have had these robustly. These were among the so-called preternatural gifts that God would have given Adam and Eve. And then because of the fall, it's been speculated that's why they don't work so good for us anymore. But maybe when we're like Jesus after the resurrection, we'll have them robustly again. So that's some Christian speculation on that. We also cover, you know, UFOs. Uh, we cover religious mysteries, including apparitions of the saints. Um, we talk about the Bible and, you know, mysteries connected with the books of the Bible, the Mark of the Beast, the Antichrist, all that kind of stuff. Well, I've certainly uh, had a chance to witness some unexplained things in the medical uh -huh. arena, things that there is absolutely no scientific explanation for. So I I do believe there are other dimensions, there are other things that are going on. And, uh, you know, I want to commend you for being a person who doesn't just accept things. <laughs> who really uses that incredible brain to investigate. And that's one of the reasons I wanted to do this podcast is show people, you know, sometimes we don't have enough evidence to be definitive, but that's why we have these brains. That's why we have the investigative genes, the curiosity, and uh, we should we should use it. We shouldn't just sit back and accept what's told us. Uh, you know, I, I think back to COVID mm -hmm. and uh, all the so called so called disinformation mm -hmm. that turned out to be correct. Um, you know, people need to to use that brain and investigate things for themselves, whether it's UFOs or whether it's what's 
good for you to eat or what's healthy for your children to learn. Uh, and that's the reason that God gave you those incredible brains. And uh, is there any last thought you want to leave us with? Uh, no, just thank you for being here and if, if for bringing me here. And if uh, people would like to learn more about Mysterious World, they can check it out on YouTube. My YouTube channel is youtube.com slash Jimmy Aiken. It's also available on Apple and Spotify and all the standard podcast apps. And you can go to its homepage by going to mysterious.fm, just like FM radio, mysterious.fm. Well, that was fascinating, having Jimmy Aiken here taking a, a logical look at this thing that has been so fascinating this summer regarding uh, aerial phenomenon that are unidentified. Uh, stay tuned. Uh, keep your ears open. Keep your eyes open. Be watchful and think. That's really the point of this particular program. Think for yourself. Uh, don't let other people tell you and just accept it. And that's why we have these incredible brains. And that's all we have for this week. Uh, make sure you subscribe for free, Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, Spotify, wherever you get your podcasts. A rate us, review us, tell your friends about us, and help us to spread common sense. Let's make it common once again. And remember the cornerstones that made us great. Faith, liberty, community, and life. See you next week.